Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to Repro Action's Act and Learn webinar for October 2022. Today's topic is an extremely important one, global solidarity to prevent maternal and infant mortality. So first, we'll introduce your hosts um, today from the Repro Action team. First voice you're hearing is Erin Matson, me, myself. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm co-founder and executive director of Repro Action. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I am Erin to the max on Twitter. <laughs> and hello, everyone. I'm Ivania Woods, pronouns she, her. I'm the movement building and research manager at ReProAction. I am in the middle of Missouri, halfway between Kansas City and St. Louis in Columbia. Um, and my handle is Ivania Star. My actual name. Didn't make that. Awesome. We're so excited you're here. So um, today's agenda. Um, we'll do a welcome. Then um, Ivania will do a topic overview on global solidarity to prevent maternal and infant mortality. Then we're really excited to be joined by our panelists today. Um, we'll have a presentation from uh, FOS Feminista, and that is our panelist, Sammy Luffy, um, who will do a presentation. Um, then we'll do a presentation um, from Brianna Lipscomb at the Center for Reproductive Rights. And then finally, um, we'll do a presentation from Laura Horwitz at Generate Health in St. Louis. So um, a real range of organizations that do um, international, national, and local work. And we're really excited to bring that intersection to you today. Um, then we'll talk about next steps and uh, do Q&A as much time as possible at the end will be devoted to Q&A. So a note about that. If you have questions for anyone, any of our speakers today, whether it's one of our panelists or whether it's for Ivania um, or myself, um, just put those into the questions tab and we'll get to as many as possible at the end. I'm going to go ahead and answer our most frequently asked question right away at the beginning. Will there be a recording shared of this webinar? Yes. There will be, and um, we will be posting it on our website, and we will also be sending it out um, to our email list. Uh-oh. Yeah, it just looks like we're just having a technical um, issue, so it's fine. It's not you. <laughs> oh, man, okay. All right, Eva, I am, Ivania, I am back. I My internet just died, but I'm piloting it off my phone. I'm so sorry about that. Did you finish up the agenda for me? <laughs> no, all yours. I was just telling people that it's fine. It wasn't them. They were worried about if it was their computers and it's not. No, it was my computer. My my network, my internet connection at home just decided to die. So I apologize um, profusely for that. Um, thank you for reassuring folks. So. Um, so I'm now on a secure internet connection through my phone. That should not happen again. Um, if it does, of course, Eva, just feel free to rest control of the presentation um, and, and move it along. Um, but as I was saying, any questions, put them in the questions tab. We'll get to as many as possible at the end. We will send out a recording of this webinar to everyone who RSVP'd and our email list, and we'll be posting it on our website in coming days. So um, you don't have to write everything down if you want to be able to access this later. And if you would like to live tweet and join us in doing so, which we'll be doing from our ReproAction social media account, shout out to Natalie Newman on our team who does that for us. Um, you can join the conversation by using the hashtag ReproAction. Um, and thank you to everyone for uh, sitting, bearing with my uh, techno hiccup. Sorry about that. So a bit about repro action. We lead bold action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We're deeply proud of our left flank analysis. We're known for our willingness to hold folks on all sides accountable uh, uh, for increasing access to abortion and advancing reproductive justice, whether they're traditionally considered allies or opposition. And we have a deep commitment to nonviolent direct action as one of the tools in our toolbox. And I'd also just like to recognize that ReproAction was co-founded by myself and Pamela Merritt, who is co-director uh, of this organization with me for five years. She's now uh, executive director of Medical Students for Choice and is actually um, the honorary chair of our advisory council. So uh, she's still involved in the work and we appreciate her very much. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Eva. Thank you so much for that wonderful intro. 
Um, so today's webinar, uh, we want to give organizations an opportunity to highlight the work that they're doing at multiple levels. So of course, first, shout out to ReProAction. If you wanna learn more about our maternal and infant mortality campaign, you can go to our campaign page, which is on our website at, website at reproaction.org. Um, the campaign was launched in March, 2017 here in Missouri, back when I was the Missouri organizer, I still lead the campaign, but now it's more of a national, it's broadened, the scope has broadened outside of Missouri. Um, we focus on addressing racial health disparities and a key component in our work, as you will see today, is working with and uplifting people's work. Um, so today's panelists are discussing what their organizations are doing to address maternal and infant mortality globally, nationally, and locally, and they'll be presenting in that order. As reproductive justice advocates, it's important to know about the work being done and how we can support each other's work. So this webinar was put together with that in mind. I want everyone who's attending to consider how the information being shared here today can be useful in your workspaces. Like, don't just sit here and take in the information, take it with you when you get back to work in your area. All right, thank you so much, Ivania. And I'm very pleased to introduce our first panelist, um, Samantha Sammy Luffy at Fos Feminista, um, where uh, Sammy is the policy research officer at Fos Feminista with expertise in US foreign policy and global and sexual reproductive health rights and justice. Sammy holds a Master of Public Health from the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in Atlanta. And prior to joining Fos Feminista, Sammy was the Senior Policy Research Associate at Change. Uh, before that, Sammy was a program analyst within the Office of HIV AIDS Research Development at USAID. Sammy, we're so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, Erin and Ivania. This is such an honor to be here, um, to be given this opportunity today. So. I am so happy to join uh, today's webinar. And as Erin mentioned, my name is Sammy Luffy. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the policy research officer with Post Feminista, which is an intersectional feminist alliance dedicated to advancing sexual and reproductive health, rights, and justice globally. It is an honor to discuss this important issue today from a global perspective. And we're going to describe the um, impact of US foreign policies, funding decisions, and other actions related to global health assistance on maternal and child health more broadly. We can go ahead to the next slide, please. To begin, it's really important to note that the US government is the largest donor to global health in the world. As you can see here in these incredibly helpful graphs created by the Kaiser Family Foundation, Congress appropriated $12.2 billion in funding for global health in fiscal year 2022. Then this figure has been cons relatively consistent over the years. And if you look at the pie chart on the right, global health assistance includes funding for a range of programs, including HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, as well as maternal and child health, family planning, and nutrition. So this entire system is referred to as global health assistance. The next slide, please. And here is a screenshot from foreignassistance.gov, a public interface for anyone to learn more about the larger foreign assistance system, of which global health assistance is just one part. Foreign assistance includes funding for peace and security, humanitarian assistance, education and social services, et cetera. This is a super, super helpful tool if you're interested in learning more. Next slide, please. And as you may know, a number of policies and restrictions apply to how US foreign assistance funding can be spent or which organizations can receive global health assistance funds. And there are different actors who control these restrictions. For example, Congress passed the Helms Amendment in 1973, which states that, quote, no foreign assistance funds may be used to pay for the performance of abortion as a method of family planning or to motivate or coerce any person to practice abortions, end quote. So this law controls what can and cannot be done with U.S. foreign assistance funds. The global gag rule, on the other hand, is a presidential action, meaning that a president can either instate or remove it. The policy prohibits foreign non-governmental organizations that receive certain categories of U.S. global health assistance funds from providing 
advocating for counseling on or referring for abortion services as a method of family planning, even if they use their own non-US money. So this controls who can receive US global health assistance funds. This policy has been instated by every Republican president and revoked by every Democratic president since 1984. To dig a little deeper, Former President Trump expanded the GGR days after he was inaugurated in 2017 to not only apply to the funding for global family planning programs, but all of U.S. global health assistance for the first time. As you can imagine, this expansion was devastating. Research conducted by academic and civil society organizations around the world, including Post Feminista, have documented the detrimental impacts of the GGR in all its forms across the global health landscape including on maternal and child health programs and outcomes. The US government's policies and funding decisions related to global health have impacts beyond restricting funding for a particular type of service, such as abortion. They are examples of the neo-colonial nature of US foreign assistance that can have far reaching impacts, particularly on advocacy efforts related to the liberalization of abortion law in countries that receive US foreign assistance, and the legality of abortion, as we all know, directly impacts maternal mortality. Next slide, please. At Fos Feminista, we created a tool called the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Index. Known as the SRHR Index, this is an interactive tool to hold the US government accountable for their actions related to global health, such as the expansion and the recent revocation of the global gag rule. The SRHR index also outlines clear, realistic, and achievable recommendations to promote sexual and reproductive health rights and justice through US global health assistance. We created the SRHR index in partnership with the Global Women's Institute at the George Washington University and released the first grades in 2018. The SRHR index is a tool that allows advocates to learn more about US global health policies, programs, and budgets. Next slide, please. As of September 2022, just last month, the SRHR index now features grades from 2016 through 2022, or 2021, excuse me. So it includes the last year of the Obama administration, all four years of the Trump administration, which you can see as the decrease in the graph on the screen, and the first year of the Biden administration. Next slide, please. The SRHR index evaluates the performance of actors working in US global health assistance. So there's six actors here the White House, Congress, the Department of State, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, and the Department of Defense. We chose these six actors because of their prominent role in global health assistance. And we grade these actors only in the domain or the domains in which they work. These include family planning, maternal and child health, and HIV and AIDS. Some of the actors, like the White House, work in all three domains, whereas others like the Department of Defense only work within one domain. And we chose these domains because they represent the core funding streams of US global health assistance and because they mirror the silos in which many global health programs operate. These domains should not be interpreted as what is important in global health and SRHR, but rather what is funded by US global health assistance. Next slide, please. Each actor is scored on the actions and budget decisions that are within their control, and all data we use for the SRHR index must be publicly available. This means that for the White House, we are scoring executive orders, presidential memoranda, and legislation signed or vetoed by the president during that year. We also score the president's proposed budget amounts for each of the three domains. For Congress, we look at legislation passed by both the House and Senate as well as the global health appropriations for each of these domains. Implementing agencies like the Department of State and USAID are a bit different. We look at internal policies and procedures related to or in any way affecting global sexual and reproductive health and rights programs. We see these actions as an expression of the agency's direction, management, and guidance, as well as their support for or opposition to global SRHR. So for each year of grades, we score the actions that were issued or edited in that given year. And we'll get to the agency's budget calculations a little bit later. Next slide, please. Each action is scored based on the level to which it either hindered or promoted SRHR. We do that by asking if each action is based in evidence, consistent with international human rights norms, 
responsive to need, and gender transformative. We call these our cross-cutting issues for scoring. By using these issues, we're able to look beyond merely the categories of family planning or maternal and child health or HIV and AIDS to make sure that each action addresses all of SRHR, that issues like comprehensive sexuality education, gender-based violence, and abortion are addressed, to make sure that policies are working to improve maternal health and move beyond merely serving the general population, but are tailored to reach all populations who can become pregnant including people of diverse genders and sexualities, sex workers, and young people. Let's take a deeper look into one of these actions to understand what this scoring process looks like in practice and how maternal mortality is considered as a factor in scoring for the SRHR index. The best way to do this is by reading the rationale statements, which explain how each action either promoted or hindered SRHR in the domain which it was created. Next slide, please. A key action that USAID releases each year is called Acting on the Call. Each year, this report describes USAID's global maternal and child health programs and outlines key accomplishments and challenges in that year. Next slide, please. The rationale for this action can be found by clicking on the actor you're interested in on the left-hand side, in this case, USAID, scrolling down to the domain. Here, we're looking at maternal and child health. And then you open the policy drop-down menu as indicated by the orange plus sign in the bottom right-hand corner. Next slide, please. So I recognize that the image is super tiny. This is the rationale for acting on the call in the MCH domain. This action moderately promoted SRHR in this domain because it described USAID's approach to contributing to sustainable development goal three, including reducing global maternal mortality to less than 70 deaths per 100,000 live births per year. It also includes newborn and under five mortality in a select set of countries where USAID conducts these programs. As you can imagine, it describes the impact of COVID-19 and climate change on these programs too, two pressing issues that continue to impact maternal and child health outcomes, including mort maternal mortality. However, this report used gendered language throughout. It referred to, quote, pregnant women, instead of using inclusive terminology such as pregnant people. Taking all of these factors into account, this action only moderately promoted SRHR in the MCH domain. But let's pause. So I said this was a maternal and child health report, right? But what about the other domains? Well, HIV can affect maternal health, including maternal mortality. So a report like this needs to be scored in the HIV and AIDS domain as well. Additionally, this report describes USAID's efforts to integrate maternal and child health with family planning programs. So of course, it was graded in the family planning domain too. This is one of the actions where we can clearly see how the same action can receive different scores in different domains. Next slide, please. Surprisingly, when we scored this action in the HIV and AIDS domain, information about HIV and AIDS activities related to maternal and child health were largely lacking from this report. We know and have known for a long time that evidence documents the complications from HIV are a leading cause of death among women of reproductive age around the world. And to be clear, we use the term women of reproductive age here because this is what the global indicator uses. So for a report focused on women of reproductive age to leave out HIV and ignore the maternal health needs of people living with HIV who may be pregnant, this report simply is not based in evidence in this domain. So then it, this is reflected in the report's lower score in the HIV and AIDS domain compared to the other two. Next slide, please. In the FP domain, this report included data about modern contraceptive usage and stressed the importance of providing contraception at primary health centers. And we know one's ability to control the timing and spacing of their children is directly related to maternal health outcomes. Similar to the MC, MCH domain though, this report referred to women and couples use of contraception, which excludes all people who use contraception. So this action only moderately promoted SRHR in the FP domain. Next slide, please. All right. So now that we've looked at the action side of the SRHR index, let's talk about the money. U.S. global health funding should go to the countries with the highest need. When it comes to maternal and child health, that means we're looking at publicly available data from the World Bank, the WHO, UN sources, and foreignassistance.gov to calculate the level to which agency funds were spent in countries with the highest maternal mortality ratios. 
This is specifically for the MCH budget calculation. As you can imagine, these budget calculations are complex. The time we release of publicly available budget data are vital for the public to know where global health funding is being spent. In this way, our budget calculations allow us to advocate not only for additional funding, but for that funding to be spent in the countries with the highest need. Next slide, please. So let's zoom back out to take a look at the SRHR index grades for the domains and the USG overall. The overall USG grade is indicated by the line in the graph shown here. The HIV and AIDS domain receives the highest grade across the entire index, as you can see in the teal line. This is, is mostly due to the US government's bipartisan support for PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which implements programs that are largely based in evidence and consistent with human rights, though they could be more gender transformative. Generally, these actions and funding decisions promote SRHR. Next slide, please. The maternal and child health and family planning domain grades, however, are generally lower because oftentimes these programs are left out of whole of government reports and key agency level actions, which hinders SRHR because it reinforces the siloed nature of global health programs and does not support the implementation of integrated programs based on evidence and human rights. So this is the MCH domain grade over the years in this graph here. Next slide, please. Importantly, the family planning domain grade is often the lowest domain grade. The SRHR index captures the fact that generally, the White House requests and then Congress appropriates inadequate funding for global FP programs. And in some cases, implementing agencies do not disperse family planning funding in countries with the highest total fertility rate. And this is a trend that the index has documented throughout the years. Next slide, please. As you can see, the index contains a ton of information, maternal mortality data, technical guidance that supports integrated programs, and service delivery in countries with the highest need are all vital pieces of the methodology. As civil society, as advocates, as US taxpayers, as champions for human rights and justice, however you may contribute to this effort, we have the opportunity to hold the US government accountable for the decisions it makes about global health. And when it comes to global health spending and policies that impact the health and rights of people around the world, it's critical that we know what decisions the US government is making. Without this knowledge, we cannot effectively hold the US government accountable. So here, the SRHR index puts all of these decisions in context. It provides comprehensive picture of how global maternal and child health programs do or do not acknowledge leading causes of death among women of reproductive age. It also documents whether they disperse global health funds in countries with the highest maternal mortality ratio. As a result, we are all able to better advocate for integrated programs that meet the needs of communities in their unique context. Next slide, please. I'm about to wrap up. If you'd like to learn more about, more about the index, I invite you to check out the website. The SRHR index is your one-stop shop for all actions related to global health assistance. And you can check out all of these actions on the library page which includes all of the actions going back to the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961. As administrations change, Congress, bureaus change, sometimes documents get lost, but not anymore. You can always count on the index to find all the documents you need related to global health assistance. Next slide. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm always available to answer questions about the SRHR index. Clearly, I love talking about it. And I'd also like to thank my brilliant colleagues, Bergen Cooper, Bjorn Ruth Snyder, Liana Felicachete, Dikshita Ramanarayanan, Jill Montilla, Samita Rao, and many others who have contributed to the index over the years. And our vision is that the SRHR index will lead to stronger policies and programs across the US government that will advance universal access to, to sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. I'm so grateful to ReproAction for bringing us together to discuss these important issues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sammy, and I am uh, so grateful for that presentation, and I'm pleased to pass it back to Ivania to introduce our next panelist. All right. Yeah, thanks, Sammy. Um, Brianna Lipscomb is the Senior Advisor of Maternal Health and Rights for the Center for Reproductive Rights. She received her Master's of Public Health from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She has over 15 years of public health experience and currently develops 
advocacy strategies to promote Black maternal health, particularly in the South, by mobilizing a broad base of stakeholders to advance state and federal policies. Brianna also serves as the Board of Directors Co-Chair for the Black Mamas Matter Alliance and was recognized as the inaugural Kira Johnson Advocate of the Year by March for Moms in 2020. So Brianna, passing it to you. Thank you so much and thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our policy strategies to address the U.S. maternal mortality crisis. Um, so I'll be focusing mostly, obviously, on um, some of our national conversations around maternal health. Next slide. Um, uh, just a quick roadmap of my presentation. I'll do some level setting. I'll give some maternal mortality data. I also want to talk a little bit about how um, at the Center for Reproductive Rights, we've been integrating human rights principles into the conversation around maternal health. Uh, and access to safe and respectful care. And then I will discuss um, our comprehensive approach to policy change. Uh, next slide. So we'll jump right into it. You know, here, this is really just showing how the US is measuring up against other countries. Um, the US has the highest maternal mortality ratio of any other wealthy country in the world. And recent CDC reports indicate that 80% of these deaths were preventable, 80%. Next slide. And I think it's really important to note that while the number of women who die in childbirth globally has fallen in recent decades, the rates in the US have gone up. And you can see that in this slide here, where in just the past couple of years, we've seen a sharp increase um, in the maternal mortality rate. And I, I always want to point out, because we've tried to shift the narrative over the past couple of years, that the high maternal mortality rate in the U.S. is often blamed on the poor health of mothers. But when a comparison was done with other wealthy countries, um, it really undermined that argument. So similar wealthy countries with increased rates of cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, and other conditions during pregnancy still have a lower maternal mortality rate than we do in the U.S. Next slide. This slide is demonstrating the sharp um, disparity, the wide racial disparity um, in maternal mortality. So that third set of bars you see represents non-Hispanic Black um, people, um, as opposed to a, the group of white people immediately to its left. So why do we see such wide racial disparities and inequities in maternal mortality and morbidity rates? Um, to better understand how we ended up here, and I just want to be clear that Black um, black women are three times um, more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications. Um, indigenous women are twice as likely to die from pregnancy-related complications as compared to white women. Um, and so we have to acknowledge the historical context of um, the existing health inequities. So many of the stigmas, attitudes, biases, um, et cetera, around Black maternal health and Black maternity care providers and birth workers, all of that is steeped in historical traumas and injustices, such as enslavement, uh, reproductive oppression, and inhumane medical experimentation. Um, one study I always like to point out is that um, when uh, groups of uh, black birthing people and white birthing people were, were looked at, um, both groups having the same pregnancy complications, the same risk factors, um, and yet black women were still more likely to die from those pregnancy complications than white women. And why is that? So that is what we have to talk about. That's what we have to center this conversation around, that it's not about whether or not someone was overweight or not, it's why is it that folks that have the same risk factors are entering a healthcare system and coming out with different outcomes. So preventable mortality um, is both a form and a symptom of discrimination against women and birthing people, and it deprives birthing people of their right to live a healthy life. And reproductive rights violations are informed by and reinforce discriminatory stereotypes, practices, ideologies, um, perpetuating discrimination against already marginalized groups. And we believe that ensuring safe and respectful care at birth is a critical piece of the pathway towards racial and gender equity. Next slide. 
So really quickly, I want to give some background on the Center. So the Center for Reproductive Rights is a global legal advocacy organization, and we've been reforming laws and policies worldwide since 1992. Uh, and in fact, in our other global regions, we've been working on the full spectrum of reproductive rights for quite some time, including maternal health. Um, but in the U.S., I think most people think of um, our work on affirming, um, affirming access to abortion care, which is incredibly important, right? But we do work on other issues, <laughs> such as access to fertility care, and then, of course, um, the work that I lead on maternal health. And so in 2018, we launched our Maternal Health and Rights Initiative. Next slide. So our Maternal Health and Rights Initiative promotes the human rights of pregnant, birthing, and postpartum people in the United States. Um, we seek to improve access to safe and respectful maternal health care for all who need it, and to ensure that all people have the opportunity to attain the highest standard of maternal health possible for themselves. And so we seek government accountability for discrimination and inequalities in U.S. maternal health, and we provide advocates and lawmakers and leaders um, with advocacy tools that they can use to catalyze policy change. But what's important to us is that we have these guiding principles, these principles that are rooted in a human rights um, framework. And in the interest of time, I won't go through all of these, but just a few that I'll highlight. So first and foremost, we believe that maternal health is a matter of human rights. We believe that racial disparities in maternal health are indicators of racial inequality that gender discrimination contributes to negative maternal health outcomes. And probably most central and most core to the work that we do is that we believe that movements for change are most impactful when affected communities lead. Next slide. So maternal health is a very complex issue, and I certainly don't have time today to talk about all of the root causes other than racism. We can say that together. Racism is a root cause for maternal health. Um, but because it is such a complex issue, it requires policy change in several areas to move the needle. And so in order to frame our policy advocacy, we've identified these three bucket areas um, to help us prioritize the types of policies we feel are necessary to make a difference. So first, um, to ensure data I'm just moving us through quickly. So on the next slide, when it comes up, the policy strategies, we've um, really thought comprehensively about, you know, what are all of the mechanisms that we can leverage in order to improve maternal health in the U.S.? And so at both the state and federal levels, we are engaging legislatures, Congress, but also administrative agencies. Um, we're also looking at litigation as a tool and UN advocacy. So looking at the state level first. So as I mentioned, we provide technical assistance to many partners. Um, we also provide um, a lot of technical assistance to state legislators. Um, about how do we advance proactive maternal health policy rooted in those same human rights principles that I mentioned briefly earlier um, to make sure that we are eliminating the inequities in maternal health systems and that we are prioritizing community-based provision of care. And so at the state level, what that looks like is efforts to expand midwifery licensure, to make sure that midwives that are based in communities, midwives that look like the communities that are most impacted by maternal mortality are able to provide care to the people in their own communities. Um, because we know that over the past century, there was a systematic effort to drive both Black and Indigenous midwives out of the profession of birth work. So how do we restore 
um, that access to midwives. Um, second, we're looking at securing insurance coverage for doula services because we know that when Black people enter the healthcare system, they are more likely to receive low quality care. They are more likely not to be listened to. Um, and so doulas provide um, support in a way that provides almost a, a protective factor to um, birthing people of color in healthcare systems. So how can we make sure that insurance is making that care accessible? We're working on extending Medicaid coverage to 12 months postpartum, because I think we can all agree that 60 days after um, delivery is not enough time to make sure that um, a birthing person is well. Um, and then finally, we're also looking at addressing racism and bias and the impact that that has on the care that is delivered, because we know that that underpins all of um, the, um, the, the quality of care that's needed in order to improve birth outcomes. At the federal level, we're working on many of those same things. We're just doing it through different avenues. We were heavily involved um, in the American Rescue Plan and the provision for a Medicaid extension to 12 months there. Also the Black Maternal Health Momnibus. And we've been working really closely with um, federal agencies within um, the US Department of Health and Human Services like CDC and also the Medicaid agencies. Um, litigation, we, the center is well known for our um, abortion litigation and we're looking at how we can use those same concepts and practices and apply that to expanding access to safe and respectful maternal health care. And one way we're doing that is looking at how we can expand the GWIFRI licensure um, potentially through litigation. And finally, the last piece that I'll mention is our international um, human rights advocacy through the United Nations. And so the picture on the right is um, earlier this summer, I, along with a, this, a really great delegation of other black and indigenous folks, went to Geneva to talk about all of the human rights violations that our communities are experiencing as it relates to access to maternity care and abortion care. And so we leverage engagement with treaty monitoring bodies like the um, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, we engage with what's called special procedures like a special expert on poverty or on the right to health um, and talk to them about these human rights violations in the US that many people don't realize are happening or they don't think that these types of violations could happen in a place like the United States. But what we know is that racial discrimination, racism and bias um, have a strong influence over the health inequities um, in our access to health care in this country. So we're leveraging all of these um, methods um, of policy advocacy. Next slide. Um, and then just finally, just really quickly, some policy pitfalls. Um, I think that a lot of times people think they're doing great when it comes to uh, maternal health policy. And then there are a few things that make us just scratch our heads. You know, we've seen an increase in interest in criminalizing um, birthing people that have used drugs during pregnancy. Keep in mind, there does not seem to be any effort to criminalize folks that are using opioids during pregnancy, only other substances. And of course, that has child welfare implications that are more likely to impact um, Black families. Um, also, special carve outs for the postpartum Medicaid extension. Everyone should have access to this. It should not be for certain subsets um, of eligible folks. Um, penalizing community-based care. So in one, one, one moment, they're saying that they're um, providing insurance coverage for doula care, but then they restrict who can be considered a doula or who's eligible for those reimbursed services. Um, and then finally, diversion of state resources. So as we continue to see uh, abortion restrictions uh, roll out across the country, there seem to be um, an increase in investments in crisis pregnancy centers, but we're not seeing those same investments in community-based maternity care providers um, and birth workers. So um, we're having to be really vigilant about these types of policies. Next slide, and I promise this is my last one. So how can you get involved? One, integrate maternal health into your advocacy. So if you're talking about um, other reproductive health issues, you should include maternal health. We should be talking about the full spectrum of um, reproductive rights, health, and justice. Um, second, support state and federal sign-on letters. So as you know, opportunities arise for you to um, support, your organization to support, please sign on um, and show solidarity. Call out the hypocrisy. Similar to what I mentioned about folks increasing investments for 
um, crisis pregnancy centers or passing abortion restrictions, but then we can't get them to um, pass policies like paid parental leave or paid sick leave or affordable childcare. Call out the hypocrisy and help us um, kind of thread the needle and, and, and connect the dots about how all of these issues are interconnected. And finally, if you are entering the space of maternal health advocacy, please, please, please take the lead from community-based Black and Indigenous maternal health advocates that are already doing this work and are already on the ground. So I will stop there because I want to make time for the other presenter and also time for questions. But thank you all so much um, for your attention. Thank you so much, Brianna, and apologies for the snafu on um, the slides earlier. Uh, next up is Laura Horwitz, um, who we're very pleased to have join us today. She serves as the Senior Manager of Planning and Partnerships at Generate Health St. Louis, an organization addressing racial health disparities and infant mortality in St. Louis. Laura leads Generate Health's community-led investment work, which has deployed nearly $3 million in grants to 105 organizations since 2019. She has nearly 20 years of experience in community organizing, training and capacity building, and program design and evaluation. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I might uh, move through some of my slides at the beginning a little faster than I planned because Brianna did such a nice job of uh, laying out the backdrop of what maternal health data looks like um, across the country. Um, so uh, my name is Laura Horwitz. I'm the Senior Manager of Planning and Partnerships at Generate Health. And um, I'm really excited to tell you a bit about our organization today and the context in which we work. Generate Health is a coalition that brings together a wide variety of individuals and organizations who are working to advance equity in our maternal and infant healthcare system. Much of our work really focuses on engaging Black families who have experienced pregnancy difficulties or infant loss as the leaders in devising policy and systems change solutions and building a bridge between uh, those community perspectives and changes that may be underway or need to be underway in our healthcare systems and among the many providers that touch families during pregnancy and the first year of an infant's life. Our North Star is to eliminate racial disparities in maternal and infant mortality. My work particularly focuses on bringing philanthropic resources to grassroots community-based nonprofits that are supporting Black families in the zip codes where infant mortality is at its highest. The way I often think of it is that we know our existing systems not only poorly serve Black birthing people, but were in fact never designed to meet their needs. That means a huge part of our work is the long-term systemic change to overhaul, dismantle, repair, and reimagine healthcare systems to be more equitable. And in the meantime, there are families who are expecting babies every day and they need support now. So an equally important part of our work is finding, strengthening, uplifting, and partnering with community-based support systems that already exist. Um, I'll start today by talking about uh, what mortality rates look like in Missouri and how that context drives our work. And then I'd like to share a little bit about our goals and approach and invite your support and participation in our mission. So let me tell you about the state I live in. Basically, the trends that Brianna laid out um, are very much mirrored here in Missouri and in some ways more so. We have uh, abysmal outcomes for maternal health. Our state has the seventh highest maternal mortality rate in our country. Um, and that danger is especially pronounced for Black birthing people. On screen, you can see summary data from a report issued this August about pregnancy-related death in Missouri. This report was put together by the Pregnancy Associated Mater Mortality Review Board, which was established by law in 2019 to improve data collection um, in our state about maternal deaths. 
and uh, is now a 17 member board that meets regularly with the state's Department of Health and Senior Services to review any instance in which a birthing person dies during or up to one year after pregnancy. Those trends are then documented and analyzed and data is shared with the public in an annual report. So that really connects um, with the policy priority Brianna was talking about, about really having strong data collection drive our ability to address this um, mortality, maternal mortality crisis. So, you know, the numbers themselves are very startling, but what really stands out to us at Generate Health is two things. The first is the uh, stark disparity in outcomes for Black and white Missourians. Um, black birthing people die at a rate that's three times greater than white birthing people. And second, that the vast majority of these deaths are preventable. Um, most are caused by underlying mental health conditions. And we already know that. We already know um, what we need to do to solve these problems because it's been well documented. Um, in reports like these, but also we've heard this again and again and again from our community voices. Um, and more so, we know that these numbers tell a very small part of the story because every death represents a huge loss to families, communities, neighborhoods. Um, and so all of these are the foundational why of why we do our work. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shares some of the same data, just from a few different angles. So what I'll highlight quickly here is that you can see that the disparities between black and white birthing people really exist across the entire care continuum, whether that's access to prenatal care or to paid maternity leave. Um, and like I said before, when it comes to prevention of maternal death, our community has been quite clear about their recommendations, which is more access to high quality, culturally congruent mental health services and prenatal care. Um, the final note I wanted to make is that uh, we have some updating to do across um, these slides, our thinking in general in two ways. One, um, we have decided that uh, we need to be more gender additive in our language and I'm noticing um, after Sammy spoke that uh, there is some hit and miss happening in these slides in particular where we're not consistent in our use of language. So I wanted to note that. The second is we are really just beginning to understand how the pandemic has uh, further exact exacerbated existing inequities in our healthcare and so social support system. And I know that's true for a lot of local um, actors. So uh, one more data piece on the next slide is, um, of course, if mothers aren't faring well, it would hold uh, to logic that our babies are not faring well either. And that's certainly true in St. Louis City and St. Louis County, where we have one of the highest infant mortality rates in the United States. When you disaggregate that data by race, black babies are three times more likely to die before their first birthday than white babies. Next slide. Um, I have two more slides where I'm going to talk about how we ground our approach. And I'm going to skate through them pretty quickly because of the previous context. And also, I think we have a pretty savvy audience here. So um, we ground everything we do with a, uh, within the framework of social determinants of health, uh, which really suggests that the majority of factors that affect how a particular medical condition or interaction with a provider is going to go happen well before um, a person enters that the hospital or that interaction. In fact, it's estimated that um, individual medical care makes up only about 10 to 20 percent of a person's health outcomes and the other 80 to 90 percent are due to the social determinants of health. Um, for us here in Missouri, that includes our state's history, our state's history of slavery, and in the St. Louis region, our particular history of redlining, racial covenants, environmental racism, of course, where the um, place where Ferguson happened, all of those things are really the root causes to so many of the health disparities that we 
face and a huge part of our work then is really shifting the narrative about what creates health from this dominant idea that it's all about individual behavior to um, what we find to be true through this image and through our work that um, systemic and upstream factors play a much larger role than is often acknowledged. Next slide, please. We take the same view when it comes to grounding our work in uh, the history of systemic racism. Um, and just note that very few studies that look at medical outcomes ever consider the history that shapes those outcomes, um, which is really different than when you talk to community leaders about their own experience. Uh, one example, um, just to bring it home, uh, I grew up here in St. Louis, um, and it wasn't until working for Generate Health that I learned that there are many um, Black women in our community today who can tell stories about um, being segregated to the basement level of our largest hospital when they were giving birth. Um, and, you know, that's still in the lifetime memory of many, many mothers in our community. And so, um, that's what people walk into their experience holding. Um, to sum that all up, the next slide uh, takes and puts into image um, a way that one of our community leaders really describes how she feels about hospitals and doctors. Um, in her view, hospitals and doctors are to black women or black birthing people as police are to black men. Moving on um, to our approach, um, we believe that everyone has a role to play in changing systems and improving health for babies and families in our region. Um, and we really center community voice in our work. <laughs> our primary uh, initiative to carry out community-based work is called Flourish. And um, through Flourish, we have leaned into and learned again and again that community members who are most impacted by the issues of uh, maternal and infant mortality have the wisdom about what needs to change as well as the ideas for solutions that will advance equity. Um, it, you're good. Um, <laughs> if you can go to, yes. Yeah. So um, Flourish works to reduce uh, disparities in infant mortality and our approach to doing so is a collective impact approach that really centers uh, community voice. And this slide talks a lot about what we believe it will take to shift complex and trans systems that produce poor, disparate maternal and infant health outcomes. So we've been at this work now for about 10 years and some of the early changes we are seeing includes more pathways for community leaders to share their knowledge with organizations and more capacity within those organizations to address racial inequities. As we've built out our community leadership model, which I'll speak about in a bit, we get approached by other organizations to help them bring community engagement into their decision-making processes. And we're beginning to see uh, many of our community leaders position at decision-making tables in, in that influence health practice and policy across our region. We're also seeing more resources channeled to community-led priorities. That's um, a piece that gives me particular joy and pride um, as my specific work has been focused on bringing institutional philanthropy dollars to grassroots community-based organizations. And probably the biggest change we've seen overall is greater awareness that racial disparities exist in infant mortality, that we have a crisis in our community, um, that we're losing black babies at a startling rate, and a, a reframed narrative that this is a systemic rather than an individual issue. Um, with that, we still have a lot more work to do, um, but that's a bit about what's been happening so far. Now I want to tell you a little bit about what we mean when we say we center community voices, because we say that a lot. So 
Um, we do that in a number of different ways. We've always had community engagement as part of our work in um, the ways that lots of nonprofits do, where we listen and we do focus groups. And um, basically, we reach out to the community when we need information about how to devise our work, right? Um, but about eight years ago, we really shifted that approach uh, to one in which community leaders uh, are centered in how decision making happen in very tangible ways. So we've established a community leaders cabinet that provides the strategic direction of our Flourish initiative. And um, what that looks like is uh, not only grounding the work in the, the real stories of people who are affected by these issues, but also uh, when it came to having an opportunity to distribute institutional philanthropy funds, this is the group of people who decided how those funds would be distributed, uh, what the funding pools would look like, what the priorities are, what the process would be like. So the priorities they identified were um, that we focus on, this is the next slide, um, four areas, coordinated quality care, safe sleep, capacity building and racial equity, and social determinants of health. And uh, with that direction, we have invested $3.2 million in over 100 organizations through a grants process uh, where the decisions were made largely by community leaders who themselves have uh, experience pregnancy difficulties or infant loss who live in the zip codes where uh, infant mortality rates are at its highest. Um, and we set up a grants process that was uh, really unheard of in our region, not only because the decision making was participatory, but because we tried to have really low barrier of entry. So we provide support to new grant uh, to new or organizations that hadn't written a grant before. We provide technical assistance, we provide fiscal, fiscal sponsorship, um, all those sorts of things. Uh, we have also, uh, the grant making is one piece of what we do, but we also work with um, our larger healthcare providers to coordinate uh, services for maternal mental health, home visitation, and safe sleep. We do that work through what we call our Bloom Network. And uh, we have trained individuals across our region in safe sleep practices and established a port crib network, just to name a few of our other um, ways of coming at this issue. Next slide, please. Um, fundamentally, we are building a movement to shift how uh, decisions are made about healthcare provision in our region for maternal and infant health. And um, the particularities of the work I lead started with grants, but what we're trying to do is build a networked ecosystem of care. So this map, um, for those of you that don't know St. Louis well, um, is really just to say like, look at this reach, like we are really creating that net um, as we go along. Um, Without getting too down into the weeds, we also do um, advocacy work. Uh, we make sure that um, our community leaders and systems leaders have a chance to interface with each other and understand each other's perspective. Um, and uh, we have a great data hub on our website. It sounds like I'm not going to have time to get through the rest of our slides, but you will probably have time to view them on your own. And I thank you so much for the time today. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, really appreciate it. And thank you to um, Brianna and to Sammy and of course to um, Ivania Woods on the Repro Action Team who pulled this all together. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time for questions today. Um, however, um, we do hope you that you will stay tuned. We will send you information about our next Act and Learn webinar for November, and we will be sending out a recording. Thank you so much to all of you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.